Hello and welcome to Springboard, your virtual university. My name is Albert Okran, welcoming you on behalf of Team Springboard, led by Comfort. Springboard is your most inspirational show and the point where the greatest minds converge. Your virtual university is proudly brought to you by the Springboard Roadshow Foundation in partnership with the multimedia group and proudly sponsored by MTN Pulse, the enterprise group UMB Bank, with support from the graphic business. Today we begin a brand new series, we've been talking about it for a while, called the Executive Hotline. The name tells it all. We bring you CEOs, heads of institutions, and busy executives you would otherwise not be able to have direct interactions with and allow you to ask them the questions that are on your mind and on your heart. We literally create a hotline for you to interact with them. All week long, we'll be talking about the fact that we'll be hanging out today with Professor Bill Buena Populampo, the Vice Chancellor of Central University. And today we have him here in the studios to answer your questions. Prof, good to see you. Good to see you too, Reverend Albert. It's great to have you. Thank you for making time to be the first guest in the, on the executive hotline. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm honored. And <laughs> you can imagine that there are several, I, I'm sure there are students of CU, <laughs> students of other universities, people who have begun their careers, people interested in HR or organizational behavior, and your various areas of interest who have sent in their questions. And I'll be mm. telling our listeners a bit more about your career uh, as we go along. But let's go straight to the first question from Edwina Annan in Accra. Mm -hmm. Edwina says she's torn between conflicting professional paths, ostensibly at the beginning of a career journey. And she's asking, mm -hmm. did you always want to be a vice chancellor? And did you, were you always clear about how you would get here? OK. Thank you, Edwina, uh, for that question. And I'll put it this way. <clears throat> it is natural to be torn. So she's not in a bad place. We're human. We are not computers. We are not binary entities. We're human. And that means that you have a whole mix of emotions about different possibilities for your life. And that makes it possible for you to have a thought about, oh, I want to be an advertising executive. Oh, I want to be a doctor. Oh, I want to be something else. So that's very, very normal, very natural. Over time, Edwina may settle in a little bit, depending on the sort of advice she takes and depending on how she sees her own capacities going forward. So, but let me come back to the other question that she asked as to whether I always wanted to be a vice chancellor. And that's where my little story is. <laughs> and Reverend Albert, perhaps um, I'll write a book about that one I think one day. <laughs> Interestingly, I have actually always wanted to be a vice chancellor. Why? Interesting. Um, I come from a rather academic or knowledge-based type of family. My dad did his master's in the US several years, ages ago, he's passed away now. My grandfather was one of the very first to study from Ghana, to study at Johnson C. Smith University uh, in, in South Carolina, I think it is, or North Carolina, one of those. So there's been that trajectory. But throughout my years in university, University of Ghana in the uh, uh, early 80s, I so enjoyed watching faculty teach. I enjoyed the engagement with students. I enjoyed the fact of actually shaping young people's minds in the classroom. And I thought, no, this career really is for me. I recall one of our lecturers then, at that time, she was uh, Miss uh, Adra Kwating. She taught her psychology. And she, she carried herself very, very well. So I'd always wanted to be in academia. And ultimately, of course, in academia means becoming a vice chancellor, head of the institution. I recall by the time uh, we finished Legon in the early, mid, mid to, uh, early to mid 80s. After the final exam, June, May, June 1985 or so, I climbed up to the vice chancellor's lodge with a number of friends, some of whom you may, you may know. Uh, it's the vice chancellor's lodge. And I stood 
by the lodge. And I took a photo of the lodge. At that time, he had a metal plaque, Vice Chancellor's Lodge. And I pointed to it in the photo, and I said, I shall be back. Almost like an old Schwarz nigger. <laughs> <laughs> Are you serious? Yes, I said, I shall be back. This was in 1985. At that time, of course, there was no central university. At that time, there was UG, KNUST, and UCC. Those were the universities in town. When I tell my children that there were only three universities, they don't believe it. They don't believe it, yeah. They wouldn't believe it. It's, it. Now the field is full. They wouldn't believe it. So I took that photo. And then I left off for postgraduate studies and so on. But the reality of that photo stayed with me. And so everything that I needed to do to come into academe and to grow in academe, I began to do. So I started teaching in the UK. I was at the University of Westminster for a while, then came back to Ghana and got a, a job with the University of Ghana. I was at the business school. And to grow in academe, you do have to do your research and you have to write. So I did that. Little did I know that perhaps by my own statements and God's own grand design, what he was preparing me for was for Central University. Why do you think so? Well, at a point, I was approached by CU, Central University, at that time it was Central University College, to go work as dean of the business school, Central Business School. At that time, I had not contemplated leaving Lagon. I was due to travel to Canada on a conference uh, when that invitation came to me. So I said, okay, let me take the time away to reflect and to pray. I was away for about two weeks or so, and I did have the time to reflect and pray, and came back, I wouldn't say convinced that it was the move to make, but I came back with a clarity in my spirit that yes, do it. So then I went to CU, uh, uh, then to CUC, and I stayed at the business school for a few years, two, three or four years or so, and then came back to Lagon. And then coming back to Lagon, uh, Central University followed me and said, no, we want you back. And it happened at a point in time when the uh, then Vice President for Academic Affairs, uh, the uh, fantastic elderly gentleman who I respect so much, Reverend Professor Emmanuel Adobin, who was C VC of Cape Coast some time ago, and I'd come to Central University as Vice President for Academic Affairs. He was leaving. And so the vacancy as Vice President of Academic Affairs had been created or was, was, had come up. So I was asked to return and fill that role. The rest, as they say, yes. is history. However, 32 years to the month, when I stood in front of the Vice Chancellor's Lodge, at the University of Ghana as a young undergraduate, just graduating, 32 years to the month, I was appointed Vice Chancellor of Central University. Exactly 32 years to the month. I hear you talk about two things, and they are so strong starting points out of Edwina's question. Edwina, thank you for saying that question. I think it's a bright start to our conversation. <laughs> you talk about career navigation, and you say it's all right not to be too sure when you start, but with time, as you move on, clarity sets in. That's right. And you also have to put in the effort to build the blocks to where you want to be. That's right. The second thing you bring, to, you bring home is the power of pictures. I wouldn't say vision because it's a word that has been used quite a bit, but the power of a picture. Mm -hmm. You say you stood in front of the, the metal plate yeah. that leads to the vice chancellor's lodge. Which, which hall were you in? I was in Commonwealth Hall. Um, Okay. I'm not going to comment on it. Don't comment on it. I mean, that is where but, all the good people... And here in, I am. In, I was in Commonwealth Hall as well. Crowd. Oh, oh, you were. Oh, oh absolutely. So, V-mate. V-mate. Simple. Simple. Oh, so, you see, <laughs> so, the Vice Chancellor's Lodge is just behind Commonwealth Hall. So I can just, just imagine that... So, you stood in front of that metal right. plate and said, I will be back. I said, I will be back. 32 years later, after navigating your way through different places and God guiding you, you came back not to the same university but a different one That's right. as vice chancellor. 
32 years to the day. Yeah. Let's look at what happened in between those 32 years. And I have a question for you from Chris from Accra, who says, what is the best career decision? And guess what? Your worst <laughs> career decision. <laughs> I guess that, that speaks to the uh, in-between points. Yes. And I must say my best career decision twofold. One was the decision to pursue uh, an academic career and therefore to look for the opportunity to do a master's and then a PhD. That, that was the first. The second was when I uh, decided that I'd look for the opportunity to teach in the UK. And so it was a great opportunity I had to, 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 to be appointed as lecturer at the University of Westminster. This was in the early 90s. Those were two major career decisions that I made. The subsequent ones, I think, were built upon by those two major career decisions. So if, if anybody asks, as, as, as uh, uh, Chris has asked, those two were the major best career decisions that I, I have made. I am not sure if I can recall any worst career decision as yet. I've sort of been blessed by having a certain clarity as to where I want to go. So I have avoided alternatives that could have come up. Of course, uh, there may have been, there were one or two temptations or uh, efforts to drag me away from in, in, during this period or in the intervening periods. But clearly, for me, having decided to teach in the University of Westminster, having earlier decided to take a PhD, those were fundamental to the progress and to the uh, Let me take a minute to explore the the reason why, I mean, you, I've seen a number of universities that you, from your CV, mm -hmm. I've seen University of East London, mm -hmm. University of Westminster, yes. External Examiner for Rhodes University, mm -hmm. Pretoria University, yes. Northwest University, mm -hmm. Makare University in Uganda, Visiting Scholar at Pan African University in Nigeria, you've done Legon. Why is Westminster in particular of interest to you in this conversation? I think it's important because two things. One, it gave me the opportunity to cut my teeth and bite my teeth into what it means to be a full-time faculty member at an old institution. The University of Westminster started out as a central uh, college uh, in, 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 in the Central Polytechnic in, in, in the UK in 1879. It was an old place on Regent Street in the middle of London. And the opportunity to work in such an old, established institution was but, just fantastic. You've seen their building. You've before. seen their building, exactly. Fantastic. Now they've grown and they have campuses all over the place in Harrow and Marylebone and so on and so forth. But it was fantastic. Apart from that, there was, uh, which is why uh, human contact and human following and, and, and journeying with someone is so important. When I was at the University of East London as a graduate student, he was head of the Department of Psychology where I had my PhD. And he had moved to the University of Westminster as head of school. And he was the one who recruited me my first job at Westminster. But on recruiting me, he took me out for lunch and sort of literally talked me through what it means to be an academic. Mm. He didn't spend that much time after that with me. But what was important was this old gentleman took me for lunch, spoke with me, gave me the, taught me the ropes as it were and said, Bill, this is it, you're on your own. And that experience, that time, that contact for me has been fundamental, significant, uh, 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 you know, to the extent that it's, it's comparable to this, the, the PhD supervisor that I had at University of East London, but significant that this gentleman gave me the opportunity to start out. That's why Westminster rings so strong in my mind. Give me an idea of the name again of the gentleman. It's Professor Keith Phillips. Keith Phillips. That's right. He wasn't your supervisor. Nope. He wasn't. Would you say that underscores the importance of having mentors who are not necessarily your lecturers, your supervisors in the office, but who can speak into your life and bring you guidance? Absolutely. And I think the notion of mentorship has been too narrowly defined. Help us to get the right definition. You see, a mentor, it's an old Greek uh, 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 word, that's where it comes from. A mentor, someone who is looking after or looks after or steers or guides. It's not necessarily someone who is with you AM to PM Correct. And, and always you're following. Not at all. So mentorship is about speaking into people's lives. 
Mentorship is about showing someone the ropes. Mentorship is about guiding somebody. Mentorship is about dropping a word here, pointing somebody in the right direction, as the case may be. And it could be distal. I mean, the mentor could be 5,000 miles away. Or it could be once every three years you speak on the phone. But the important thing is that there is mutual respect and regard, and there is sufficient humility on the part of the person who is being mentored to listen to the mentor. And that is fundamental. That is absolutely critical. That is important. Mutual respect and regard and humility on the part of the mentee mm -hmm. to listen and learn from the mentor. Those to you yes. are the keys. They're fundamental. Let me go over to Banju Gamdia, who you have quite a large following, and to mm. Juan, who says, were there times you found yourself being drawn away from your career path, and how did you find a way back? Well, yes. I mean, there were one or two times uh, 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 after I returned from the UK and I was here in Ghana, there were one or two times when the attractions of moving into industry and commerce because of the rather uh, poverty-stricken levels of pay of the academic, uh, uh, you know, there were one or two times when the attractions were there. I had very juicy offers from places that I wouldn't mention. Uh, uh, and, you know, if I had taken those offers, uh, obviously I would have overnight transform my economic circumstances uh, by 100 plus fold. But I think I paused many times, and that's one of the key things that I'd like to say about uh, our career growth. We need to pause, be intentional, to ask ourselves questions, and not seek uh, uh, growth and direction simply because somebody says do it or because it seems attractive. Let's pause and ask ourselves some questions. So I did the same. I paused and asked myself some questions. And in asking myself those questions, it became clear to me that, look, you seem to know what you want to do. Good things can come to those who wait. So wait your time. Stay with the script. Do what you've got to do. Learn what you've got to learn. Add, be additive and cumulative in your growth and you will find that fulfillment will come. And that enabled me to stay with my script and with academe. Talking about staying with the script, let me bring you a question from Idrisu in Teaching Man, mm. who says, if you had to do it all over again, will you still do what you're doing? I will stay with the script. Stay with the script. I will stay with Idrisu, the script. Idrisu, your question is the one with the fastest answer. I will so stay far. with the script. Now, the reason why it is important right. and why one needs to understand this is this. Let me use... Uh, our Lord Jesus as an example. Mm. Jesus was sent. He had a mission. He could have, if you like, uh, deviated from the mission. And he had a short time to fulfill what he came to do. 30 years of growth, three years of ministry, and that was it. He stayed with his script, despite the different things that would have happened to him. He was in the temple, he taught, and at 12, people were astounded at what uh, uh, he could do. But he stayed with the script. So I think staying with the script is important when you have interrogated yourself sufficiently and you understand where you want to go with your own life, and that helps you stay with the script. You, you just have spoken to a different category of people without even realizing. Because I'm going to bring you a question from um, from McDonald from Maryland, mm. which is traveling on a different path from what you're talking about. You see, if you have interrogated the path and you feel this is what I was born to do, you do it with conviction, joy, everything. But McDonald is asking, what advice would you give someone who has been on a career path for several years but just feels that this is not where they belong and they need to start all over again. What would you say? Again, uh, like I said from the beginning, that is also perfectly all right. We're human, and I said that, and we're human, and as human, we will have different experiences as we grow. And those different experiences will teach us and learn us to know that actually perhaps where I am right now is not as good as I should be. And there are many, many uh, uh, executives and senior people, as well as younger people coming up, who have had that experience to realize that, no, perhaps I need to change tack. I need to change track. For example, it is possible that in the beginning, you were pursuing a financial agenda. You were very, very instrumental and utilitarian about what you were doing. And so money was it. But 
as time went on, you know, I'm a little more fulfilled. I have what I think I need, and, and there's a certain gnawing emptiness inside. It is important to listen to that and to decide that, okay, maybe now I should change. But in the changing, I always like to put it this way. Ask yourself, as I change, what will enable me to make a successful change? If in making the change, you're going to be slapped with so many financial difficulties that it will cripple the effort to change, then you've got to take your time about the change. So we need to ask ourselves those very important questions. Let's break it down for the person listening. So you, let's say you are working in a bank on the high street. Everyone, everyone thinks this is it. you got a good job at driving a car. You, you, you go to the bank. But anytime you wake up, you're driving to the high street, you're upset because upset, yeah. you love flowers. You would have loved to do horticulture or something that involves a talent that you have. And you're seeing that when you come to that realization, it's not too late to make a decision. Nope. However, do some analysis and look at the financials. Exactly. So don't jump into it. Exactly. Is there ever a cutoff point where you say, no, at that point, you have to just oh, yes. live, there, with, live with the one you are in and, and die in it? There is a cutoff point. Sometimes for different people, you start the effort into, to use your example, into flowers. So you start that effort. And as you go along, you realize that actually uh, it's making some significant for me. On the, on the, that's what you do on your Saturdays. So I can earn from this. I can find fulfillment from this. I can decorate my church, my colleagues' homes, whatever, from this. And at that point, you decide, OK, this is it. I'm going. I've made some savings. But it's also possible that you, you want to get into baking, or you want to become a, you were in, on the high street in, in bank, you want to become a teacher, a lecturer, whatever it is. But as you put the numbers together, you've got three kids in high school. You know, one is 17, the this, other is. This is what they call the real deal. This is a real deal. One is 17, the other is uh, 13, the other is eight. And the fees alone every year are. Now, at that point, you've got to ask yourself, if my husband or I are not making sufficient to be able to cover those fees and pay our rent or our mortgage or whatever else it is, before you take that leap, ask yourself how you will survive. Now, it doesn't mean it should cripple the effort, but it simply means your planning for that must be more careful. You've been in HR, you've been in organizational psychology, organizational behavior. You are seeing that these tough questions must be a part of our decision making and career planning. Is that Absolutely. What That's what I'm saying. Do you they find that we don't more. do it enough? Well, I think sometimes people don't do it enough. I've, I've come across quite a few and, and without prejudice and without apologies, sometimes small businesses that fail are because of the self same thing. My friend is doing A, my other friend is doing B, my cousin is doing C, I'm going. But there are different things that help to sustain a new business or a new career trajectory or a new interest. And that's why I say we do need to interrogate these things a little bit. I mean, someone may say that, well, but I've interrogated them. Some of the numbers add up, some don't add up, but I want to make them move. I wouldn't stop you. But you've got to know that down the line, as someone once said to me, when the tires, when the rubber hits the road, when the rubber hits the road You've got to be clear that it was my decision. No blames to anybody. One thing I can tell you for sure, it is my decision to go on break at this point. <laughs> <laughs> and I join you in that. I, I, yes, let's, let, let's take a break. When we come back, I'm going to te tempt Prof to tell us a poem before we continue. Because oh, Prof is so talented. And for those of you who didn't know, Prof is talented as a preacher, a speaker, a poet, so for all those of you who have multiple talents and multiple abilities and you are pursuing a career, it's okay to have all of them and still stay with the script. When I come back, I'm, tell, I'm going to tell you the first five lessons I've gleaned from this beautiful conversation. But let me say a big thank you to our partners, MTN Pulse, the Enterprise Group, UMB Bank, and the Graphic Communications Group, and of course, the Multimedia Group for providing the platforms for us to have this conversation. Let's go for a break. When we come back, Let's ask him about Central University. What is different? And let's hear from some very, very heartbroken um, listeners and viewers who have sent questions about the future and what he can do to help them attain the desired future. Please don't go away.
Don't be left out. Download the Pulse app from the App Store or Play Store to mash up all day, every day. You can also enjoy more mashup. Just buy the new Mega Bundle and get 3 gigabytes data, extra 400 megabytes for your social apps, and free MTN to MTN calls every Monday. So go ahead, feel the pulse on MTN Pulse. Just be We're good together everywhere you go. There once was a man who had it all. He had skill, he had charisma. He was loved by all, but above all, he knew the importance of helping others, lifting others up. He knew the importance of giving other people an advantage so that they too would use that advantage to help others. All you need is that advantage that sets you apart from the rest. And when you discover that advantage, life's challenges don't seem so daunting anymore. That's where we come in. Enterprise, your advantage. UMB was established in 1972 as the premier bank for the corporate and private sector in Ghana. From our very beginning, as the only Ghanaian bank serving all categories of businesses, we set a standard for excellence and innovation over the past 45 years. We've built a financially healthy and strong bank, demonstrated our commitment to our customers and to growing businesses, and exhibited originality and innovation at every turn. At UMB, our focus is built around people, service, products and technology. These are the key to our present success and our future triumphs. At UMB, we are poised to make a difference not only with our customers, but also in the banking industry. We invite you to share in our future. Our future starts now with you. Welcome back to Springboard, your virtual university brought to you by the Springboard Ratio Foundation in partnership with the Multimedia Group and proudly sponsored by MTN Pulse, the enterprise group UMB Bank with support from the graphic business. Let me remind you that on Tuesday, get your copy of the graphic business and you will find the full transcript of this wonderful conversation with my guest for today in the first edition of Executive Hotline. Professor Bill Buena Popolampu, the Vice Chancellor of the Central University. For those who love notes, so far I've been learning about career navigation, the power of pictures, decisions, mentoring, and my favorite so far, staying with a script. I'm going to come back to you, Prof. And before the break, I was talking about your multiple talents and abilities. I got a question um, earlier on from Sam, who was asking about your various interests and abilities as a person and your hobbies and how they dovetail into your work. And that's what inspired what I mentioned, that you do different things. What, what, apart from your work as an academic, what are the other interests that you have? Well, Sam, Sam wants to know. <laughs> well, they are not, they are not uh, exotic anyway, <laughs> very simple. I enjoy reading. Reading, okay. I enjoy driving. Sometimes just sitting in my car and driving around. So occasionally one of the ways I clear my mind is I'll watch if it's not too late, 9 p.m., I'll just hop in my car and just drive around Accra, quietly just drive around. Uh, sometimes when I go to my town, hometown, Adan, and I'll just drive around to the riverside, seaside. Just, just, I enjoy driving. I enjoy... What, what does it do to you? Does it inspire you? No, it's, it's a calming thing. You need it. Yes, it's a calming thing. And I think um, if you have, and I, I, I like cars, I confess. Uh, if you have a six cylinder machine with, uh, you know, uh, V8, or, yeah, V8 or V6 and uh, 3.5 liter, and the engine is purring and is quiet, it's calming for you as you drive around. You know, you and Comfort will be very, very good friends. Really? I tell you, because <laughs> Comfort, one of Comfort's dreams uh -huh. is to go on the Formula One circuit. Wow. 
Oh, and, Silverstone. And, and, yes, Silverstone or Abu Dhabi and just, just drive on the I see. I, well, I'll probably join her because there's something to the 150, 120 MPH that does things to your soul. You must go to Germany and drive on the autobahn. Autobahn. Where there's know, no, no speed, speed limit. limit. You know? I don't have a well, V8 your anyway. wear, your, your students will be wearing... You don't have a V8. I don't have a V8. <laughs> but your, your students will be very surprised that the academic they know is talking about cars. Cars, you know. I can imagine. <laughs> That's so right. reading, reading, driving. Uh, driving. I enjoy poetry. Poetry. I, That's I, the one I know. And Yes, and I, I play squash. Right. And uh, squash is also very... It, it serves a couple of functions. I think one of the challenges to me is that uh, leaders, executives, and CEOs are voluntarily unhealthy. <laughs> I think we should make the time to get off our chairs and get onto the uh, 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 court and play, run, whatever. So I play squash at least twice a week. That's it's good. Very, very, the, the cardio you get from exercising your heart is just fantastic. You know, and it's one of those sports that exercise your whole body. Right. So these are my, my, my hobbies. We share a couple of them. I read. I read, I write, I... Mm -hmm. Driving is not my thing. Oh, and, I, right, and, okay. I, and, I, and, and I'm not in that your bracket with comfort. <laughs> I, I do tennis, yeah, no, the, okay, swimming, you do tennis, right, and then I do okay. walking. Okay. Walking is okay. great for me. And okay, okay. I, I recently did a 27-kilometer walk to wow. raise funds for Scripture Union. Wow. On my birthday. Okay. So, I mean, I, I love that. You love that, okay. Let okay. me stay with poetry, which I mentioned before we went on the right. break. Right, right. And something I've known that you do for several years because right. of our... Association with Calvary Road. Recovery Road. And our evangelistic right. work several years ago. Ago, that's right. So, I, I would like you to give us one poem. One. Wow. So, let me give you a choice between. Give me two poems, let me choose one. Okay, and, all right. Um, one old poem that I, I did a long time ago with uh, a late departed brother. You know him, Reverend Paddy Brew. Wow. Uh, there's a, po a poem we call then, A Soul is a Soul. It was so famous in those days. In those days, days circles. a soul is a, a soul. It's a soul. It's a soul. It's precious, precious to God. God. I, I, and it was Reverend like... Paddy Brew and I that did that. Right. So first time at the Art Center. Right. Uh, so many years ago. And, and it, was, it, 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 cut, it, cut, it cut to the bone of what our Christianity was all about. Right. Another I must tell you, um, just not to interrupt you, but I must tell you that what I liked about that poem, mm -hmm. if I may say so, is the fact that it highlighted the fact that the person may be a carpenter, it may be this, it may be that, but it's precious to God. Precious to is God. that one of the philosophies of your life? That is one of the philosophies of my life. And that is one of the things that I will not negotiate at any point in time. I believe, Albert, that God created us in his image, one and two, in sending his son Jesus Christ to die for us, he meant to die for any and everybody. And post our salvation, Albert, nobody is more saved than anybody else. Mm. The blood of Jesus Christ and the grace that came for all of us is equal for each and every person. A soul is a soul is a soul. And it's precious to God. I mean, without reciting the poem, you recited it. <laughs> And, and I love it. Yeah. I loved it then, and I still love, love it, it now. now. And I, I, I celebrate the memory of one of the biggest mentors of my life, That's Reverend right. Emmanuel Ibrahim Paddy 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 Paddy. I used to call him P. yes. Big yes. Paddy. That's we right. have a lot of other names, so we will not use them here. The other poem is, 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 is called Soup. You know, Soup also has some significance for me for, for several other reasons. <laughs> Personal interest, okay. I, must, I must confess. You enjoy but your it's, soup. Not, it's not a poem, but it's one of my interests. You enjoy <laughs> it's, not, your soup. it's not a hobby, but one of my interests, I must say. So, <laughs> so I know a soul is a soul, and I've told you why I like it. I like soup because um, Kofi Akpabli once shared his writings about, about Ghana and our tourism, and he wrote something about soup. Mm -hmm. It ended up being published in the newspapers and everything. Right. And, and I like the fact that it throws a light on aspects of our culture that people right. take for granted. So right. you know what? Let's do soup. We should do soup. Let's do soup. Soup is soup. Crabby WhatsApp fingers soup is soup. Light soup, palm nut soup, peanut butter soup, okra soup, soup is soup. Yesterday, the goat decided to leave the soup. The other day, before the dry snail snailed itself into the 
stew because the soup was too light. Tomorrow, that confused pretender called crab, Tolo Bifi, garden something, has decided to jump out of the soup. But soup is still soup. You ate it, licked your fingers, sat back, belly full rubbing the pot. And the soup was, is, will be a nourishment. Soup is soup. You know, you know the thing about your poetry? Simple, thought-provoking, humorous, and it's always thematic. It ends on a point that is emphasizing a truth. Do you deliberately write it that way? I deliberately write it that way. Tell me why you wrote so Because um, I deliberately write that way because I think uh, in, in, in secondary school, I was taught literature by two of some of the greatest teachers. Uh, Mrs. Late, Mrs. Achampong was in Presec. I was in Presec, the best school. That's um, another debate. Uh, yes, another can debate. Can <laughs> <laughs> and and, and uh, late uh, Miss Omabu. And they were very intentional about language and its use and how construction matters in communicating. So when you, when you do something like a poem, you're not just putting out words. You're trying to send a particular message. If you look at the sonnets of Shakespeare and all the rest of it, very, very brief, but to the point, and they have a message. You mentioned later to Kuyokai. His poems always had a message. So that's, that's the point. Now, Soup, I wrote uh, in 2017, when there was a homecoming for uh, all of us who were uh, Calvary Roaders in the old days. And when I looked at the spread of all of us from those days. We were in secondary school, young minds charged with what the gospel is about, and we all went out and did different things. And Albert, as I'm sure you know, the charismatic space of Ghana today is populated by people who came through that process. And I looked at it, and some of the battles that have been fought and the unfortunate circumstances that have happened in some instances, and some of the uh, dissensions and changes, I concluded that what have we all been about? We've been about the gospel. We've been about Jesus Christ. We've been about his work, soup. So whether we became crabs in the soup, or okro, or garden egg, or tolo, beefy, whatever we became or have become out of that soup is it's still soup. soup. And as long as we allow that soup, of Jesus and his message to influence us, soup will we'll always be soup. Always be soup. That's it. Oh, man. <laughs> you know, just for the record, a soul is, is a, soul, a soul, and, and it's soup is still soup. Still soup. <laughs> That's it. If you just joined us, this is not a poetry <laughs> class. This is a special edition of our brand new series, The Executive Hotline with the Vice Chancellor of the Central University, Professor Bill Poplampo. And we took a little detour to find out about his poetry and other interests apart from his academic work. Okay. But let's come back to the questions you sent to us and go to Mohammed, who sends a very passionate appeal. He says, I'm a final year arts student and I'm not looking forward to the future at all. What skills or attributes do I need to survive in a competitive world? Good question. And the answers are not simple. At the same time, they are simple. Do you, do you think, by the way, do you think, do you think Muhammad reflects the, the feelings of a number of yes, people? Yes, of many, many people, of many young people. Right. Look, I mean, we have uh, uh, a population of 30 million. Of that, we have something in the region of 10, 15 million that are young people. And of that, 5 million that need jobs. And of that, a million that are looking for the active, able, proper jobs out there. So there's, there's a real uh, cry for jobs and to make it. And as the economy has had difficulties back and forth over the years, more and more young people find that the traditional routes and the traditional opportunities are not there. 
So it's standard, it's to be understood. Now, when he says that Mohammed says that what type of skills or whatever or, or, or abilities are needed for the world out there, um, I would have to put it this way. Number one, Albert, he needs to understand that nobody will hand you anything on a silver platter. Number two, he needs to also understand that it'll take time to build whatever you want to build and to become whatever you want to become or to get that job. Three, you need to carry on looking and looking and looking and searching. Four, you've got to have the right mindset and attitude in whatever job it is that you get to do. Five, Employers are not looking for uh, simple people who come and just dust the table and go away. They're looking for people who can be analytical, especially if you say you were a graduate of sorts, who can be analytical, and people who are knowledgeable. Not only knowledgeable about the pharmacy they've learned or the accounting they've learned, but knowledgeable about the world. And it's not everything that you will get in the classroom. So you've got to open your mind and read. And finally, um, the right attitude at which would enable you, for example, to do some volunteer work for somebody and not be demanding the world as you do that work and give, get yourself the opportunity to see and work with other and different people, no matter how small the business is, you start somewhere. There are too many young people out there who are given an opportunity to work in a small business. And they begin asking for the moon in the first six months, or after working one year, one and a half years, they want to go. Take your time. Take your time. Take your time. My advice to Mohammed is that um, these skill sets that I've mentioned, the analytical mind, the knowledgeable mind, and the attitude that enables you to say that I will do my work and do it well, those skills, you need to build them, and you need to have them, and you need to stay the course. And to remember that, honestly, um, in the present day Ghana and the world globally, uh, it will not come easy. People stay home for two years, three years. It will not come easy. And if you have to stay home for that long, then something suggests that look at whatever opportunities for running some small income earning business, no matter how small, of your own, that you may find there and then and do it. Great. Let me cross over to Kroba Odumase mm -hmm. and to Adole, who also asks a question from a point of great vulnerability, a family as a whole. She says, we lost our parents and my brilliant little sister, who did very well, has to go to university. But Prof, there's nothing the family can do. What should we do? Oh, boy. Do you find such heartbreaking there situations? There are such heartbreaking situations at our university. Difficult, because there are no easy answers. And even if you take the state institutions where, because of government subvention, uh, the fees are low, even then, to have to pay academic facility user fees of 1500 or something, even that is difficult for some people. So it's not easy. The advice, the suggestion that I would have to simply give is for Adole and the family to perhaps look up some well-meaning church, present the case to them, and see if the church can be initially supportive. And Adole and the family would have to look for opportunities to work and uh, augment. augment. You see, I say I play squash. We had a, a, a lady who came to sell banana and peanuts at the squash court. So whenever we finished playing squash, we'd have a party of bananas and peanuts. She used to come to the court with her daughter. And we noticed the daughter seemed to have be a little bright. 
we decided as a group to support the daughter of this banana selling lady. Would you believe, Albert, that we did so? And to the girl's credit, right throughout the time that she was at, I think she's just about finished or finishing, right throughout the time that she was at Legon, guess what she carried on doing? Carrying the banana and the peanuts on her head with her mother to the court and elsewhere every vacation time. And this is a student at Legon. It said something. She did not begin to think that because I'm now a student, banana and whatever is no. No, she knew that was how she was going to earn her key, despite the fact that the squash players were making some support. If I tell people that there was a time when I had such difficulty as a secondary school, I carried mangoes on my head at a to sell. So it's, it's, it's. And when I was in graduate school in the UK, I cleaned floors. So it's, it's, we just need to know that there may be help from somewhere. When that help comes, we need to find ways of augmenting that help ourselves. If we have to sell bananas, sell peanuts, sell soap, sell water, so we make some small, whatever, tabletop selling to make something small to augment the income, so be it. What you have said is so, so significant in the light of this conversation we are having. And let me just ref reference two conversations we held during the Engine Room series. And the point you made about volunteering was made very strongly by Dr. Hazel Berard, who said, for many people who are looking for opportunity, humbling themselves to do some volunteering work without a clear idea about what they may get from it could be the doorway to a big career opportunity. Absolutely. And then in my interview with, I think, Gifty Auntie, she talked about the fact that at points in her life, she had to carry and sell, don't touch me soup, do some carpentry or some, um, some work that you would call not too glamorous. Right. But she said, I did it with swag because I needed to do it at the time. And it, it paid off in helping me to finance mm -hmm. my, my education. education. I guess the lesson then for those who are asking for help is that they must also look at what they can do yes. to help to themselves. Help. That's right. Let's talk about legacy. What I would presume that as, as vice chancellor, I keep thinking of CEO, but I think it's also not a bad idea, but because you are technically the CEO of the university, but yeah. as the vice chancellor, what footprint do you want to leave? What kind of CEO do you want to build in your time and why? Thank you. Um, Central University is 24 years old, 23, 24 years old now. Um, started out as a Bible college. Great initiative by Reverend Dr. Mansal Tabil and the International Central Gospel Church way back in 1988 to 1999 when it became a, accredited to run degrees and then 2016 when we became chartered. We have a strong science program, pharmacy, engineering, uh, uh, physician assistantship, nursing, architecture, and as I'm sure many people may, may or may not know, we are the only other university in Ghana that runs architecture and the built environment courses. We have planning, design, uh, real estate management, and a range of others. We also have a strong program in business and uh, uh, economics and, and our growing program in psychology and sociology and so on. And theology was a, a big part of our, our portfolio for a very, very long time. If you ask me what my, I'd want my legacy to be, I really think that I'd want Central University to be known and branded as a Christian university, a place where students are safe, a place where the values of our Christianity are dominant, a place where the ethos, if you like, uh, of the church, and its founder are clear. It's one thing that I pray and lose sleep over that I want to see very, very much. Another area is I'd love to have Central University, which is 
you know, one of the few chartered investors in the country, and to my mind, one of the leading private investors in the country, I'd love to see us beginning to chart a stronger course in applied research in areas that take our faculty to be known as researchers. It's not easy. It's difficult. And I've drawn some flack for wanting to push that. But I do not lose hope. I also want to see a CU that has programs that enable our students to be employable when they leave us. And I must say that, uh, to a large extent, because of our applied science programs, our students, especially those who come through those programs, really are very, very employable. I mean, pharmacists and physician assistants and so on are, are re ready for market, if you like. So I want more and more of, of, of that to come through. I really would also want to see, uh, as a legacy, uh, a central university that is stable financially, stable in terms of its campuses, and stable in terms of its advocacy and its reach into the community. Why do I talk about financial stability? Um, Albert, the space is full in terms of competition. And uh, private universities. For the benefit of those who are listening to us, how many universities do you have in this country? A rough idea? Yes. I mean, there are 10 public universities, there are seven chartered private universities, and there are about 70 to 80 uncharted uh, university colleges, and then there are the eight or nine technical uh, 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 universities in the country. So it's quite a lot. And um, <clears throat> all of these uh, running various programs. Uh, so, uh, before, uh, I'd want to see uh, CU that has a range of programs and programming unique, which enable our students to be employable uh, uh, going forward. And I mentioned the financial stability issue largely because, because we depend on student fees. We have very little wiggle room for doing many things. But I think that working with our council, working with notables, working with our alums, I'd want to see more and more of a certain uh, financial stability and a certain set of funds and endowments which enable us not to have to wait only for student fees. You know, there's one thing I hate about these conversations. The, it, just when it gets juicy and interesting, you realize it's time. It's time. But before we sign off, I must give you this question from, from Michael from Birmingham. Mm -hmm. If I don't, I'm sure he will send me a query. He says, what do you think about the phenomenon of fake degrees? <laughs> just, just a minute for that one before right, we wrap just up. A minute. Unfortunately, globally, fake degrees are a matter that will not go away. There are purveyors of lies, and they will find opportunity to to prey on unsuspecting individuals. And there are individuals out there who don't want to do the work, but want to benefit from uh, uh, the, the, the proceeds of, 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 of uh, education. So unfortunately, it's with us. However, I think what is required is for those who employ to check with the institutions that are claiming on the certificate. And for us in the university sector to ensure that our institutions are so robust, our systems are so clear, that nobody can fake us. In a nutshell, that is it. And, and no fake doctrines and fake, fake titles. And... So we don't do that. Right. <laughs> we don't do that. Right. And in fact, in all our history, it's very recently that we gave uh, three uh, 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 notable people who had served on our council uh, honorary doctrines. In all our history, three. And that, so was we, very, that was a very solemn ceremony. Very for solemn who ceremony. are absolutely deserving. Deserving. Haven't contributed in that significant way yes, to the work. Let right. me tell you my 10 lessons from you, Professor Bill Popolampo. Mm -hmm. And that's a tradition on this program. Right. I uh, hear you. So listening to you, I've learned about, number one, career navigation. Mm -hmm. It's OK to start out being unsure, but with time, there must be clarity and willingness to work. Number two, the power of pictures. Right. A photograph taken in front of the Vice Chancellor's Lodge in 1985, mm. and the declaration that I'll be back, and 32 years later, to the month, 
right. being sworn in as the vice chancellor of the university of Central, Central University, university yeah. even though not the University of Ghana. Mm -hmm. The third one was decisions. And you see the two most significant career decisions. First was to do a PhD and mm -hmm. go on into academia. Mm -hmm. And the second one was specifically going to the University of Westminster, Westminster to teach. Right. The fourth was your thoughts about mentoring. You singled out Keith Phillips and the fact that he wasn't even your lecturer by the time spent with you, focused you and gave you clarity on your career. And you are seeing that mentoring works if there is mutual respect and humility on the part of the protege right. to be taken on the journey. It doesn't have to be a close contact thing. No. It can be even once in three years, but the following makes it happen. The fifth was stay with the script. You say remain focused. And several times you were drawn by financially attractive offers in corporate life, mm. but after careful reflection, you stayed the course and pursued academia. And you say, if you had to do it again, you still would do still academia. Would the sixth was changing track. You said, in some instances, you will find that after having been in a particular field for a while, you must change track. Exactly. But in doing so, ask the right questions and do it in a way that will not jeopardize your life and that of those who depend on, on you. you. Seven was a balanced life. You see, you love reading, driving, poetry, and you play squash. And you see that many leaders are on a deliberate path to their physical destruction. Right. And they must, <laughs> they must remedy it. That's right. Number eight is about patient building. And that was for um, is it Mohammed Osu who said he was scared about going into the world of work because he didn't feel that he had what it took. And you were saying, no one will hand you opportunity on a silver platter. It takes time. Keep looking. Have the right attitude and know that employers want analytical and broadly knowledgeable people and ultimately be available to volunteer as a starting point. Number nine, extra work. I love that one. He's talking about the banana and peanut, peanut seller right. undergrad right. in Legon yes. who did that to raise money to support her own educational That's journey. True. You reference your own experience cleaning floors and carrying mangoes, mangoes in a mm -hmm. in the course of your education. And the final one is legacy. You want your university to be known and branded as a Christian university where the values and the ethos of the founding institution and founder are embedded and visible. And you want your graduates to be employable when they go out there and face the competition. What will be your one minute closing message for anyone navigating their their journey in life who says, my question was not chosen to be answered by a prof, but speak to them to close us today, prof. In a nutshell, God is. God is ever present. And having created you, God has you on the palm of his hand. Amen. And that means that irrespective of the difficulty, the challenges, the whatever it is, irrespective of what those are. Tell yourself that your faith is not in another person, but in God Almighty. And God will honor that faith. God will take you from wherever you are, and he will project you. Let's remember that it's not all of us who will be vice chancellors. It's not all of us who will be presidents. But each of us has a role to play. Look for that role, and God will honor you as you do it. Thank you very much, Prof. And let me tell you the one lesson that brought the brightest light to your eyes and the highest volume to your voice. I didn't even add it to my top 10, but upon second thought, I think I'll put it right in the middle. Thank you. When you talked about the value of humanity, right. that was the point that brought out the strongest, the strongest reaction from you. Thank when you. you described a soul is a soul, mm -hmm. and thought about the fact that no matter what, every human being Absolutely. And it was visible and audible. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, Thank Professor you, Bill Poplampo. And this will be you. your very first edition of the Executive Hotline. If you've loved what you've done, you know what to do. You are right there on social media debating the 10 points about career navigation, the power of pictures, decisions, mentoring, staying with a script, changing track, balanced life, patient building, extra work, legacy, and the icing on the cake the value of every single 
human being. On behalf of Team Springboard, led by Comfort, this has been Albert saying a big thank you to MTN Pulse, the Enterprise Group, UMB Bank, the Graphic Communications Group, and the Multimedia Group, and to you out there for listening week after week. Let's do this again next week. Till then, God bless you, God bless you, and God bless you. <music>